on Dana Black coming to you live. Yes. All the way live from Black Pearl Studios, where we talk about Indiana politics from the left side of things. Yes, business is picking up, and now we're running ads. That's a beautiful thing, because when you are the number two Indiana political podcast, I mean, but, but when you think about it, though, y'all, we're the number one, number one, number one Democratic political podcast. So, I mean, yes, got to take advantage of it. And I hope that you guys are having a wonderful day. The weather is warm. It's May. Ooh, and the primary is next week. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. It's the most wonderful time of the year. No, no, no. It is not Christmas for me. It is election season, baby. Oh, my goodness. I'm excited. So hopefully you have already made your plans to early vote or you've already early voted. But if you're like me and all the early vote locations are too far for you to want to drive, you'll just go down the street on election day and cast your vote. Do not sit it out. Let's get a high turnout. Everybody show up. Even if there's only one one Democrat in a race, vote for that Democrat. OK, let's 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 show up, show up, show up, show up, please, 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 please. Because uh, uh, honestly, our lives depend on it. It, 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 I know that science hi, sounds hyperbolic, but it's not. So let's talk about it, y'all. I got a rant. The Indiana Capital Chronicle reports a three-day bench trial scheduled for later this month will put a Hoosier abortion providers and the state attorney general's office back in court as the battle over Indiana's near total abortion ban continues. Already in contention, however, is whether certain testimony internal hospital documents entered in it as ex exhibits in this case should be become public. Attorneys for the abortion providers, along with those for Eskenazi Health, which is not a party in the case, maintain that dissemination of those confidential materials will create a significant risk of substantial harm to hospitals as well as patients who received abortion care. The special judge presiding over the case has so far ordered temporary exclusion of some documents from public view, but it's not clear yet if they'll be presented at trial slated for May 29th through the 31st in Monroe County. The matter stems from an amended complaint filed in November by the American Civil Liberties Union of Indiana on behalf of Indiana's Planned Parenthood, Women's Med Group, All Options Pregnancy Resource Center, and Obstetricians, um, OBGYNs, Dr. Amy Caldwell. Their original court challenge, which alleged the ban would infringe on a constitutional right to privacy and violate guarantees of equal privilege and immunities, kept enforcement on hold for about a year. The Indiana Supreme Court upheld the ban in June of 2023, but said Hoosiers could still sue over specific parts of the ban or concrete examples of consequences. With the door left open for additional litigation, the plaintiffs are now seeking new injunctions against, against health and hospital clauses in the state abortion law, which they argue are overly narrow and unnecessary. Women's Med Group has since, since been dismissed from the case, though. The provider indicated earlier this year it had closed its only facility in Indiana and no longer seeks to provide abortions. Y'all. Do you see what I'm saying when I say our lives depend on us voting? We have a supermajority in our state house that obviously obviously doesn't really care about women. Not one bit. Not one bit. Because I don't understand how you can listen to the stories of women whose health has been, has come at risk and say, oh, it's okay. We just going to go ahead and not let you do what you need to do when it comes to reproductive health. Or you don't even care about victimized rape little 10-year-old girls. Because you are saying that if a rape 10-year-old little girl, whatever, she's got to go jump through hoops. She's got to jump through hoops. I don't see that's what happens women when we let too many men run things. I mean, think about it. Most men don't know a woman's anatomy anyway. I mean, you have to teach them most of the time, but they're right. Most of them, there's more men in our legislature who are writing policies that have to do with women's anatomy and they don't know. They don't know. Now don't, don't get me twisted. There are definitely some head maids tail Republican women in there who don't even understand their own power and are willing to throw women under the bus. But I tell you what, if we can break that supermajority, 
and maybe even flip some extra seats because all we got to do is turn out, right? If we just turn out the vote, we can make a difference. Women's lives are at risk. Women's lives. I, 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 listen, I don't begrudge nobody on who they voted for or when they voted for them, but I need y'all to stop looking at the person and saying, oh my God, I don't like that person because it was because I didn't like Hillary Clinton that now women are in certain states are having struggles with getting reproductive health care. So look at who is writing the policies, y'all. And what are those policies saying and how do those policies impact your lives? Because if you want the orange menace to get back in office again, I'm just saying there's a whole lot. We could be in a whole lot worse situation if we don't show up. You think this is bad? It can get worse. But the Biden administration is doing something positive. Let's talk about it. The Wayne.com reports the U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration made moves to reclassify marijuana as a less dangerous drug. So what could this mean for Hoosiers? Currently, marijuana falls under the same class as other drugs like heroin, ecstasy, and LSD. The, these are identified as Schedule One drugs. There is currently no accepted medical use, and they have a high potential for abuse, according to the DEA. As drugs go higher in the schedule, they are moderately moderated less. For example, Vicodin, Oxycontin, and Fentanyl are Schedule II drugs. They have a high potential for abuse, but do have medical uses. The DEA's current plan would move marijuana from a Schedule I drug to a Schedule III drug. Other Schedule III drugs include Tylenol with codeine, ketamine, antibiotic steroids, and testosterone. These drugs are defined as having moderate to low potential for physical and psychological dependence, according to the DEA. Indiana Rep State Representative Kyle Miller hopes a change will lead to state officials considering their stance on marijuana being illegal in the state. I think it's a big first step. I think it's a big first step down in the state house. Quite possibly the biggest excuse we hear for not legalizing it is they have to make some moves at the federal level. And until they do, they can't do anything, which has always been just an excuse. The, the reclassification could remove the barrier that leadership has set for legalizing marijuana, according to Miller. He explains it also it, it's always been kind of silly to classify cannabis as a schedule one drug. Y'all know why I did that. Right. Y'all ain't never seen Reefer Madness? Black and brown people, I'm telling you. Indiana is surrounded by states that have legalized marijuana in the same way, whether that be medicinal, recreational, or both. Now, the governor has said that if they were to ever reclassify it, he would revisit it. Now, here's the problem. We're already losing crazy amounts of money to Kentucky, Ohio, Illinois and Michigan, nobody is more than an hour and a half. I used to say two hours, but I'm going to say an hour and a half from a state line to go get the cannabis and gummies and whatever else they want. And it's a $3 billion business, $3 billion of marijuana sales annually. And that was just for the state of Michigan. But Indiana ain't getting none of that. Because why? It's all about power and control. See? And here's another thing that y'all need to think about when y'all go to the, to, to the ballot box on Tuesday. Are your elected officials actually listening to you? Are they listening? We already know that over 50% of, of Hoosiers, it's, all, it's closer to 60% of Hoosiers, do not believe that abortion should be outlawed. Only 13% in the nation believe it should be illegal. 13%. And a vast majority, over 55% of Hoosiers believe that marijuana should be illegal. But unfortunately, we have a super majority in the state house that is not listening to the people who pay their salaries. I don't know about y'all, but that kind of ticks me off that I'm paying your salaries and you're not even listening to what I'm saying. You're not listening to the people you off doing what you want to do because why? Follow the money. Let me tell y'all something, y'all. Everybody's campaign finance report is online at the Secretary of State site, and all you got to do is follow the money. See who these candidates are getting their money from, and I bet they're doing something special for them. That's why they call them special interests, because they paid for that specialness. They're getting pimped out to write bills that, that make the people that pay them happy. 
trust me, the dispensaries are coming. They've already set up the business. You know, don't think that you're going to just start off now. You need to go over in Illinois and partner with somebody so you can figure out if you want to open up a dispensary, how to get in the business and get in it now because it's coming. But they were just waiting. They want to get all their ducks lined up in a row. You remember when you couldn't buy alcohol on Sunday? They want to make sure they got, they want to make sure they ice people out of the process. So, guys, we have a state legislature that doesn't listen to us, that are taking rights away, and a legislature that continues to make it more difficult to cast your vote. See, because they know their policies suck, so if we can, you know, prevent people from actually casting a ballot, then what? We do what we want to do. Turn out, turn out, turn out, turn out. Please, do not wait, do not hesitate, get on the stick, and make it happen. Y'all, that's my rant. And I'm also excited that, again, I have another candidate who has decided to advertise on Turn Left. So I'm loving it. I'm loving it. Check out this advertisement. Hi, I'm Dr. Valerie McRae, and I'm a clinical psychologist from Indiana. I'm running for U.S. Senate because enough is enough. We've had enough of unlivable wages, ridiculous health care and pharmaceutical costs, housing that is increasingly unaffordable, and the turning back of women's health care rights. Go to ValerieMcRae.org. Push that donate button. Together, we can fix this. I'm Dr. Valerie McRae, and I'm running for U.S. Senate because for the last 35 years, I've worked in the prisons in Indiana and across Georgia, and I've worked with the military. And it's like I've listened to five different wars. And when I'm not there, I'm in another war because I work with Stop the Violence in Indiana. And I'm in a war with the young people who have been shot several times or someone in their family has been lost. And people ask me, why are you running for U.S. Senate? And I said, because I've worked in the prisons, because I've worked with the military, because I've worked with these young people. I don't have a right to not fight for these people. I don't have a right to stop. Just to give you a background, there has never been a female, need alone a black female, who has been on the ballot for U.S. Senate in Indiana. If you want someone to represent you for affordable housing, for wages that make sense, for women's rights, go to ValerieMcRae.org. Thank you in advance, and I'll meet you at the polls on May 7th. Today's show is brought to you by Bohm's Unique Boutique. Click on the QR code. And for all Turn Left listeners, you can get a 10% discount on your order by using the code DEMOCRAT. Be sure to visit www.bohmsuniqueboutique.com. Guys, listen, I created quite a, I created all the ads with the exception of, of Senator, uh, the candidate for Senate. So I have, I have skills. Reach out to me if you need me to help you create those things. Also, if you have some content and you want to run it on the number two Indiana political, political podcast, holla at me. I'm telling you, we here, we are here to create a thing in Indiana. Indiana Democrats have impact and we're trying to create a thing and get your message out. All all right, now I'm ready for my guests. We got all that other stuff out the way. Got all that all the good stuff out the way. First up, I, I didn't know this was the first time that this young man has been on my show. I, like, I didn't know. Like, I thought I, we chuck it up so much, I thought for sure. I thought for sure he had been on my show before. Y'all, give it up for my first guest, all the way from Bloomington, Indiana, running for County Monroe County Commissioner, my good friend, Peter Iverson. Peter. Welcome to the show. Oh, Native Black, I'm so excited to be on the number two political podcast in all of Indiana. 
could not be happening to a better person. Thank you for having me. I love it. Sounding like a DJ. Mm, mm, mm. And <laughs> first time ever getting the chance to sit down and talk to this young man who is doing yeoman's work and willing to put in the work to run for Congress. Y'all give it up for my second guest running for the Congress in the 4th District, Derek Holder. Derek, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Dana. Oh, my God. I'm very excited to be here. I love it. Fellas, what a wonderful, wonderful week it has been. Uh, tell me, was there anything in my rant that you wanted to touch on? Uh, oh, Peter, my go first. How can you not talk about it, Dana? You know, I, I've got two daughters, and they have fewer rights than their mother did at their age. It is an absolute embarrassment. And I'll tell you, the other thing... Dana, about the, what the shameful thing that's happening in our state house about taking away rights from women is that folks are leaving the state for places where they have those rights. So at a locality here, it makes so much sense to be able to preserve those rights for our residents so that they feel safe in their home communities. Hello. We got to do better. Got and, you know, I want to piggyback off of that just a little bit. You know, um, it's not just people are leaving um, because of less rights. It's the type of folks that are leaving. We have a serious brain drain. And what will happen is the, the, there will be no wage growth because the industry will look at the quality of, of, of workforce we have and tailor the work around the, the education level. Like, yo, only, only people don't realize like only 30% of Hoosiers have uh, a grad, uh, uh, a college degree and only 16% have a post, a, a graduate degree. Like, and if you're lo losing people are like, you know what, my brain's too good for this. I'm out. Like that's going to hurt us economically in the future. Derek, did you want to jump in there, sir? Definitely. Um, I mean, legislating another person's body is horrendous. Need to stop it. It's women's rights. Politicians do not need to be in the doctor's office. Um, I've said it multiple times on the campaign trail, and I'm going to channel Rachel Green. No uterus, no opinion. Um <laughs> So, I mean, we need to, politicians do not need to be making these decisions. It's a woman and her doctor. I love it. No uterus, no opinion. I like it. I it like it. I like yeah. it. All right. So, fellas, I'm going to start with you, Derek. Tell the people who you are and where you come from. Well, I'm Derek Holder, running for 4th Congressional District, which is a huge district, um, 14 counties, Parts of three other counties um, goes from touching Monroe County and Morgan County all the way up to um, Jasper and Benton, White, all the way touching Lake County. Um, it would, if elected, when elected, when elected. it would really connect um, Congressman Mervan and Congressman Carson. It would actually give a big path of blue on the northwest side of Indiana, and it would be a great block of us three driving Indiana into the future in DC. Um, I born and raised Indianapolis, Northeast Sider, graduated, oh, right. graduated from Lawrence North. Don't hold that against me. <laughs> No, that was actually my my house district that I ran in in 16, so you're good. Was it? Yeah. Awesome. Um, and then I went into the Marines, got injured, retired, came home, went to school, got a dual um, um, bachelor's degree in U.S. history and Ooh. religious studies. Ooh. Um, went into law, was a paralegal for a little bit. Um, I went to got my teaching certificate. I taught for a little bit. Um, I've worked retail. Um, I went back to um, paralegal, worked for the federal government, worked for state government. So I have spent my entire adult life in public service because I believe our country has given so much to me and my family that I have no right not to give it back. Mm. 
And that's why I'm running for Congress is to further my public service. Um, it is a calling that not everyone has, and I'm crazy enough to take up on it. Um, our current representative, Jim Baird, is <clears throat> silent on everything. Um, he hasn't even stepped foot in the district in, I want to say, seven or eight months. Jeez, um, I'm not surprised. And, I mean... We need someone that will speak as one voice for the 50,000 people that are voters that, you know, it's nearly a million in the district. Wow, that's a lot of people. Voters alike need to speak as their voice, but that gets input from them. Yeah. So let me ask you something. You know, you're I mean, you you just you done a lot of things that I'm like, ooh, I'm excited about talking about, right? <laughs> Yo, you know, we're living in a in a time period right now where there is history denialism, like election denialism. There's also history denialism. And you were a teacher and you have done I assume that you taught history. Yes. Okay. Um, and you're from Indiana. Could you uh, let me and, and reassure um, those of us uh, uh, on the blue wave that not all history teachers um, want to erase significant parts of our American history and that we understand that young kids are going to learn about things that weren't so nice? Oh, definitely. I can almost attest that 95% of history teachers want to teach proper history want to teach even the horrible things that has happened in this country we have to teach it or else we are doomed to repeat the same issues mm. <laughs> tell it tell it boy I'm, I'm i'm excited about this conversation today all right peter tell the people who you are and where you come from I, I don't know how to follow that derek holder for congress you got a lot of stuff to talk about well, everybody, my name is Peter Iverson. I'm running for Monroe County Commissioner for all of Monroe County. Uh, the iconic Monroe County Courthouse is right behind me. It's a beautiful day down here in Monroe County. Of course, this is where Indiana University and Bloomington are located. Oh. Uh, one of the deepest places in all of the United States to come and visit. We've got everything you want to do, and it's just a great place to be. Uh, and so uh, I'm raising uh, my two daughters with my wife uh, here in Bloomington. We uh, live in between two ice cream stores because that's the way you live life. And we're just so excited uh, to, to be in this wonderful community. And quite frankly, I'm, I'm running to make sure that we've got responsible leadership that can build strong relationships across jurisdictions so that we can talk about the tough issues uh, for all of the residents of Monroe County. And that's simply not happening right now. And we want to make sure that we're doing that on important issues like housing and jobs and economic vitality, DEI and climate action. These are all important topics and I uh, can't wait to get into it. So were you? did you say you were born in Bloomington or are you a transplant? No, I'm a transplant, like so many other people here in Bloomington. I'm originally from Iowa. Uh, as Wait, if I get whoa, I feel, I feel a flashback coming to me. There's somebody else I know from Iowa. Okay, I'm all right. I'm all right. <laughs> so, yeah, so uh, I worked uh, in politics even back when I was living there. I worked on Al Gore's campaign and worked with a whole bunch of really great unions and then went to uh, Appleton, Wisconsin for my undergrad, Lawrence University, and then came here to the Indiana University for my master's degree uh, from the number one ranked O'Neill School of Public and Environmental Affairs in the nation. So there's a lot of great things happening here in Bloomington, and I just feel so privileged to be part of it. So this is not your first go round now, is it, Peter? Aren't you uh, Councilman Peter Iverson? That is correct. I have uh, won two elections uh, to serve in the local government here uh, in the building right behind me. Uh, I am on the fiscal body for the county, uh, representing about the eastern third of Monroe County, and I've been doing that for the past five years. I uh, got to do some really amazing things with fiscal investments that we could get into. So what made you decide to switch from being a county councilman to county commissioner? really simple it's the housing crisis 
Uh, we just don't have enough ho homes for the people that want to live in Monroe County. Whether you get a job at one of our amazing medical device manufacturers or Indiana University, uh, there's just not a place for people to live. There's not enough homes. We don't have enough inventory. And uh, we needed a change at the commissioner level to make some, some changes to some of our zoning regulations, as well as uh, trying to understand the realities of the way that the pandemic really reshaped our, our economy and our society, and uh, just building those relationships so that we can make sure that there's a home for everyone that wants one here in Mineral County. I love it. I love it. Hey, guys, listen, I'm already hyped up. I'm already excited about the energy that we're bringing to this show today. So listen, if you like these candidates, help them out. Click the donate link, please, please click the donate link. This is a turn left fundraiser for any candidate that has t takes time out of their canvassing and uh, phone calls to come and talk to us. We want to turn these into f fundraisers. So click the link, donate. The money will be split between both of our candidates today. So come on. Don't click the donate link. So, Peter, you know, before we dive into policy issues, you know, Bloomington's been in the news lately. We got to talk about it. Oh, my God. Got to talk about it. I mean, I, I saw Senator Shelley Yoder and Representative Pierce put out statements. Oh. oh, my goodness. If, if you get a chance, go onto the House Democrats webpage for Indiana and read Representative Pierce's statement. Oh, yeah. I read it. Now, Senator Shelley, Senator Yoder's statement is really good, too. But Representative Pierce did not hold back. No, no. Well, he's he's earned it. He's earned the right to do that. So, you know, for the folks that don't talk about it, Peter, for the folks that don't know what 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 went on, but they do, they do. But talk about it, anyway. folks. No, actually, the first thing I would recommend people do is uh, Google B Square Bulletin. It's a it's a local newspaper blog that's here, and uh, the journalist Dave Askins uh, was knows in Day. Yeah, there you go. And he took a lot of pictures of uh, folks uh, who are peacefully pro protesting in Dun Meadow and uh, the Indiana State Police was called down on them and there were uh, over 50 arrests and the pictures uh, tell a, a pretty harrowing story mm -hmm. of these peaceful protesters uh, being pushed down into the mud, uh, arrested in a pretty uh, heavy handed way. And um, there were, you know, folks up on the roof of Indiana Memorial Union um, and it, it could it was a potentially volatile situation. So what are your thoughts on um, what the school administration and you see it as elected official? You can you can just go ahead and say that. Right. How did you feel about it as a councilman or as a councilman in that county and seeing what the university did? Because what they so, did was, well, let me, they changed the rules the night okay. before. So just to they, give you a heads up, they, they changed did. the rules the night before and then. Then they said, oh, we're going to arrest you on the rule change. Uh, that's a long story short, but go ahead. That's right. That's right. So you, we had uh, a number of folks peacefully protesting uh, in Dun Meadow, which many of you have been to, and maybe some of you have even protested uh, the Gulf War or other uh, been to the Bernie Sanders rally uh, in Dun Meadow. It's a known place for folks to peacefully protest. Uh, when that rule change happened, um, the tents were then uh, the were taken away and people were arrested. Uh, they were uh, processed and then taken to um, the Monroe County Jail, uh, where uh, the charges are still kind of pending and there's there's some things going on. But you know, quite frankly, these are kids who are protesting peacefully about issues that they're passionate about. And for a lot of folks in Monroe County, this is a First Amendment issue. It's a freedom of speech issue. You know, uh, being able to, you know, speak freely about the opinions that you have uh, is is an important thing to do. I, I appreciate that. Uh, you know, and I'm glad you referenced uh, the Bernie rally because I wasn't exactly sure I knew where the, the, the Meadows was, the Dunn Meadows was. Oh, I was the MC for that event. <laughs> Yes, you were. Yes, you oh, were. Where that is? Okay. I was. I was there cheering you on, Dana Black. Man, that was that was a highlight. So you know, um, uh, Derek, I know you don't. You probably don't. You obviously don't live in Bloomington. But do you have any thoughts on um, IU's handling of the peaceful protesters at Dun Meadows? It's simply a First Amendment issue. I mean, the right to peaceable assembly, freedom of speech. They're stripping away the rights because the students are saying something that the government does not like or the school does not like. And we were not built as a nation 
to be silent. Um, yeah. That's why it's in the First Amendment. So, I mean, it's ridiculous that they're doing that. Um, all charges should be dropped. Um, I mean, it's just ridiculous. And I get upset whenever I hear that peaceful protest and, no, we're just going to go ahead and detain them. For what? Well, what? I mean, not- common sense, people. Common sense. Go ahead, Peter. The, the suspensions, too, are an issue. So people that were arrested... We're now suspended for one or five years from campus. This includes students, faculty. So that's a major issue too. You know, those suspensions probably, you know, they need to be taken away. Yeah. It's, it's, it, you know, we were in the New York Times, it, you know, we didn't need to be, um, you know, Brown University's got a great example of the way that people came together to have a conversation. And that's exactly the path we need to take forward. And, you know, the more I think about it, you know, as hard as it is to attract talent to Indiana, they ought not ban people. <laughs> they ought not. I mean, the university is great, but I know that there are people who are like, do I really want to go to Indiana? If I get pregnant in Indiana, can I smoke weed in Indiana? Oh my God. Well, let me rethink that. Like, that's what and they already like they, the state capital, the state house defunded the Kinsey Institute. I need people to understand. Oh you don't understand gender and gender identity. You never will because they defunded the Kinsey Institute. <laughs> it's, it's just a nightmare. Well, and, you know, and this all blends into this housing crisis too. So not only do you not have the rights that you enumerated, but you also can't find a house. I mean, we have to take away these barriers to families moving to Indiana or we're just we're just not going to have people living here anymore. It's it's really coming down to it. We won't we, we will have people living here, but they won't be able to take care of themselves and they'll be um, a wash. And, and this ain't Florida. You know what I'm saying? Like, right. well, you know, That's Florida right. can do stupid. No, they shouldn't. But they doing stupid and dumb stuff because they have amazing beaches. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's it's warm down there. Like. It's true. You know, I, I just, I just, you would think that they would want to, I don't, I don't understand the ban of one to five years. That just, that's just asking for trouble. I don't, I don't either. And, you know, the, these are, you know, scholars of tomorrow and we should be doing everything we can to get, you know, encourage them to pursue, you know, their dreams because great things are coming out of Indiana University. It's an R1 research institution. Uh, we've got great music. We've got great science. It's just, it's a great place yeah, Let's yeah. Keep it that way. And see, Derek, um, the pe- peaceful protests are over an international incident that's happening yeah. in Gaza, Israel. Um, I don't necessarily want to talk about that because I just, I can't. Um, but you are someone who is trying, you're applying for a job where your job will be to consider a lot of international issues, right? Um, oh yeah. Talk about. I, I imagine being a marine had has had um, some impact on how you see the world. But talk yeah, about definitely. how you would, um, as a legislator, as a as a congressman, you would address a, some of our international issues. And if there's if there are specific things that you want to talk about, knock it, knock yourself out. First of all, the Ukraine situation. We have to help the Ukrainians. Um, they are not asking for boots on the ground. They are asking for weapons and material. Um, kind of like the Lend Lease program in World War II. They don't want boots on the ground. They can take care of themselves. They have been doing a great job knocking out what was supposed to be the second or third best military in the world <laughs> and making them look like chumps. Um Ukraine is doing great. They just need the weapons and material. Um, And for, once again, I'm going to have to go to Jim Baird. For him to vote against the funding package, he is not doing what the district wants him to do. Mm -hmm. He is following the Republican um, voice chamber. Yeah. And. I promise I am not anybody's whooping boy. I will not just because the Democratic Party wants me to do something. I will not do that because one, I have to answer to my employers, and that is the good people of District Four. And I have to listen to what they say. I there are times that yes, I am going to flat out say it. I may disagree with our national party but 
any good congressperson is going to disagree every once in a while. Yeah. And I have to do what's right for my district. Um, so that's <laughs> that's a major thing that people are forgetting is I work for them. I don't work for the Democratic National Party. I work for the constituents of district. And I mean, I know talking to majority of people up and down this great district, they want to support Ukraine. Um, Gaza, Israel, that one is such a touchy subject. Um, I'm just going to say we need a feasible two-state solution. Both sides have to have to come together somehow. And that is for policymakers that are wiser than I am at this point and to bring them together. And I mean, we have to stop Iran from hmm. messing with Israel right now because they're really turning up the volume on Israel down in um, Yemen. I mean, everywhere that there's a hot spot it seems like Iran is in the middle of it, backing them. And we have to turn up the volume on them, be it sanctions, um, preferably sanctions, um, with the European Union, um, just telling them, knock it off. We can live in this world together without that much animosity. Well, but see, here's the thing, like you have people like, and I don't want to call them the axis of evil because I'm not going to call people evil because that's just I mean, I, well, some people I will um, <laughs> just but but when you look at North Korea, you look at China, um, you look at Russia and you look at Iran um, and you can almost and people don't want to because they're in NATO. Um, um, look at Turkey as well. Right. There are. Um, powers that be that are looking to destabilize democracies all over the globe. They are not interested. They, they're they looking for more authoritarian bents on societies. And they, they I mean, and, and don't get me wrong. America's done its fair share of meddling in other people's business. I ain't going to say act like we ate. But, what else? Uh, pff, man. Let me tell y'all something. I'm supposed to be closer to the equator. That's all I'm saying. Um, <laughs> but my point is, is like when you're there's there 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 are obviously a lot of international issues, and unfortunately, fortunately for a congressman, you're not going to be able to just focus on what's happening in Indiana. Mm -hmm. What will your what will your style be in trying to digest all of the different pieces? Like there's there's child labor issues in the Congo with drilling and mining and uh, uh, there's just stuff everywhere, right? Just stuff. We, we're not gonna talk about the, oh, yeah. the Amazon and what's going on in Brazil and Central America. How will you begin to digest all of this intel and, and, and best serve uh, our community when you're looking at international issues? The best way to do it is what I'm doing already is I surround myself with people that know more than I do about issues that aren't really in my wheelhouse. Um, I have, I mean, I've surrounded myself with about 15 different people that have areas of expertise. And I mean, you're only as good as your worst advisor. Okay. Um, so, I mean, there are areas where I can claim that I'm a subject matter expert, but there's other areas that I'm like, I have no clue. Let me ask the person that I have surrounded myself with that knows more about the economy mm -hmm. or knows more about medical issues or, you know, um, foreign relations that doesn't have to do with military. Um, so I have to continue to do what I'm doing now and surround myself with great people, um, great intelligence, because I am a big believer. Intelligence is sorely lacked in Congress right now. Bull. <laughs> you oh. <ain't> never lie. <laughs> oh. and, and yeah, exactly. I mean, I've been told so many times I wear my, the truth on my face. 
So I, I say how it is, and I'm all for common sense, and common sense is not common anymore. Baby, but see, my mama told me that back in 1975. I ain't gonna lie to you. 1975, my mama looked at me because I was asking her why. And she told me at five years old, baby, common sense ain't so common. Yeah, it's same story, different tune. Yeah. Um, and to point out what um, Mr. Iverson was saying earlier about, um, oh God, I can't remember what he said, but you know what, right now, in India, oh, the brain drain in Indiana. That, that, that was I, me that said. Oh, that. you. Oh, yeah. my fault. Your credit my fault. credits do. <laughs> I didn't write it down. <laughs> um, but who knew that idiocracy was a template that people were trying to play off of? Well, I, I remember the first time I saw it. I saw it like ten years after it came out because I, I was like, "What are they talking about?" And I was like, "Oh, yeah. they did that." Mm-hmm. Democrats, are you looking for an affordable digital content creation solution? Then look no further than Black Pearl IT Solutions and Black Pearl Studios. Indiana's own Dana Black is providing many of the communication wraparound services any Democratic organization needs. No matter the size of the budget, Indiana's own and Black Pearl Studios have you covered. Just scan the QR code or visit www.blackpearl-its.com. Hoosier Women Forward is changing the future of Indiana. In a state where half the population is women, only 27% of our elected state house officials are women. That's why we're empowering women to take the lead, run and win. This program not only equips women with the skills to be leaders in our communities, it builds a strong network and sisterhood who continue to inspire one another to grow and lead in boardrooms, corner offices and elected positions across the state. Indiana Hoosier Women Forward program it's one of the best programs I've ever been a part of. It's really important for the next generation of female leaders to apply to Blue Jewelman Force. The amount of experience and expertise that we've been able to have access to has been life changing. I am so proud to be a member of Hoosier Women Forward's sixth class of leaders who are changing the political landscape of our state. What this organization means to me is that I have a lifetime network of hardworking, determined, fierce women in Hoosier Democratic politics that will always have my back. Being a part of Hoosier Women Forward has been amazing for the last several years. As a former candidate for the Indiana State House, the policy knowledge, the personal connections, and really just the sisterhood of women in democratic politics has meant so much to me. I really have enjoyed the Hoosier Women Forward program for a lot of different reasons. But the biggest reason for me was really that personal woman empowerment. Something that I've really liked about being a part of uh, this class and being a part of the Hoosier Women Forward um, network and group is that one, I get to be surrounded by passionate women who are committed to making our uh, state a better state for everyone. I would encourage any woman, any Hoosier woman to apply for Hoosier Women Forward uh, because you're going to be inspired and you're going to have a group of sisters to always encourage you and help you along the way. Okay, so serious stuff, serious. Okay, so one of the things that uh, both of you um, uh, uh, will have um, actual input in at the highest level of our government, at the federal government, and at the most local level of our government, um, at the county level, is, is climate change. And I know that um, both of you have, uh, are, are going to have to deal with it. And I know, uh, Peter, you, you have alluded to it. We'll start with at a local level uh, and then we'll go to it. Um, we'll go to climate and how we'll address the climate issue at a, at a federal level. But, Peter, talk about some of the ways that you want to address climate um, change, climate issues um, at that local level that this is such a timely uh, topic and you know Monroe County has already been dealing with it 
uh, alongside our counterparts at the City of Bloomington. It's a great collaboration that uh, we're engaged with the Environmental Resilience Institute at Indiana University. In fact, Monroe County uh, was the first county uh, to have a climate resilience plan to ensure that when we feel the effects of climate change, whether it be high heat days uh, or uh, flooding, uh, that uh, we are providing resiliency to those who are living here uh, in an equitable manner. So we're already talking about these issues uh, with stakeholders all across the county. And of course, the next step is to develop uh, the Climate Action Plan for Monroe County, which is going to set targets uh, so that uh, we can join our uh, our cities uh, and our, in collaboration to uh, help reduce our carbon footprint uh, as uh, we move forward because we know that some things, they're just coming down the pike. Uh, we know that that electric vehicles continue to be produced in great uh, manufacturing uh, facilities here in Indiana and, uh, and other states, and they're coming. We need to have those electric vehicle charging stations to reduce that range anxiety that people seem to be having. And we also need to work to ensure that uh, we are in increasing the electrification for the residents of this county, which means making sure that we're removing barriers for people to put solar panels on their homes, uh, which is going to help reduce those uh, those pesky electric bills. So there's a lot that we can do. Um, I'm already uh, started this work, and I'm really excited to uh, become a county commissioner to continue this work and really see it through. And see, I like the idea. I'm going to let you j jump in here in just a second, Derek. I like the idea of of adding more charging stations, but I think we're doing the charging stations incorrectly. One Ooh, is say that, more about that. Uh, uh huh. Say more about that. Well, uh, instead of you driving for however many miles and then you're out and then you have to wait for two hours, even with a supercharger, right? Two hours or whatever it is to recharge your battery. The charging stations should already have charged batteries there. So the charging battery should have a kind of a, the, the, the manufacturers to say, hey, you know, a, just like you have a, a standard AAA battery, have a standard AAA battery. You have a standard D battery, have a standard D battery. So when you show up, at the thing and the manufacturer should get together because it'll save everybody money right so you show up there's a bank of already charged batteries right you plop one in plop it out you pay we're paying if you have a a, a decent size tank now you're paying sixty dollars to fill it up you pay sixty dollars to get the char new battery and then you're on your way this well, I, and I, I think the I think the way we're doing the charging stations, the way we have mapped it out and how we want to do it across the country, we're doing it incorrectly. We should be working with these manufacturers to standardize the batteries so they're they're interchangeable, right? And so that because I'm I'm you not might gonna, be onto something, huh? I'm not gonna you I'm, might be onto something. I'm never gonna get an electric vehicle because I like road trips. And I'm not going to take what, what normally is like I, I, Nick and I will drive down to Florida. I'm not taking three days to drive to Florida. I'm not gonna no. do that. So I'm, but here's here's what the real issue is for Hoosiers. We need to bring the manufacturers of the Dana Black batteries <laughs> to Indiana. So that those jobs can be here in Indiana so that people can have that economic freedom to work in these great industries. That's what we need to do. That's, I love it. I love Derek. Um, <laughs> let's talk about climate change. You you you'll be in an in, inter, interesting for a place because you'll be looking at it from an international space, but as a national mm -hmm. place. And right. And what can we do as a nation? Talk about your vision of uh, of us addressing climate change. First of all, I want to say what climate change? It doesn't exist. I am messing with you. I am completely messing with you. Um, I have actually been certified as a green candidate. Um, so Hi. yay for that. Um, but I am all for renewable energy. I truly am. Um, I am all for charging, like vehicle charging stations, um, solar panels on the roofs of houses, on the side of the house. However, you know, you have to angle the things for it. Um, but we need to reintroduce a couple things. Right now, you cannot sell your accumulated solar panel back to the electric company. Um, we have to make it so, you know, you can sell the excess energy to the grid that way it's lowering 
your bill for one and who wouldn't like a lower electric bill um, or water bill because a lot of times citizens energy group you know water energy they're all combined in one you know lower your bills completely um also we need to get better with like you guys were talking about the charging stations my main issue with the charging stations is where do you think the electricity comes from right now it comes from diesel power right or not diesel but um from um carbon i mean it comes from coal it comes from gasoline it comes from you know the old fossil fuels and we have to get more wind turbines out there. We need to get more solar panels out there. In areas where those don't work, get the wave capture um, machines out, buoys out there on the coast. Um, put the wait, 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 wait. time out. What's a wave capture? I've never heard of that one. So it looks like a giant barrel mm -hmm. and it goes on for miles. It just sits on the ocean and it bobs up and down and just the motion of the ocean, I'm a poet and I know it, um, just the motion generates energy oh. and it's completely free just to put these, it's more complicated than Obviously. a barrel, but to put these barrels out on the ocean and just let the waves create energy. Huh. Um, they use them in Denmark. They use them in Germany. They use them in Scotland, I believe. Um, so they're in use right now. Wow. Um, and then the windmills, the windmills are, uh, what, 1500 year old technology. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, for them to say, oh, it causes cancer. How much cancer is in Denmark? the home of the windmill the netherlands i mean it's like they don't cause cancer people um <laughs> what causes, causes cancer, cancer is the contamination here in martinsville of the water plumes mm. that's what causes cancer mm. what causes cancer are the power lines that go across our farm fields that cheap houses are under or the baseball diamonds because they're put up on the cheapest land, but our kids play right underneath the transformers. But know what? That doesn't cause cancer. You're right. It's the windmills cause cancer. Well, and, and Derek, let me just chime in here too. One of the barriers that households repeatedly voice, voice is a financial barrier to exactly. adapting this technology. So federal tax credits are super important to Hoosier households if we're going to adapt this technology. I love it. Exactly. And the technology needs to get better. Right now, I believe it's 25% or 30% efficient. I know we can do a lot. Well, see, I want, see, 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 I wonder. See, I, not that I am a conspiracy theorist or anything like that. Oh, where's this going? But, but I, the powerful people make things happen powerful mm -hmm. people can make things not happen so i'm i'm interested in whether or not those that are trying to sustain the fossil fuel industry has saying okay look you know hold on chill out don't let you know slow your research down so i'm gonna give you money to you know how we was giving people farmers money not to not grow stuff mm -hmm. well, you know slow down I, not saying that it it is it just it just astonish it's just astonishing to me that I had a Casio solar calculator in 1978 and it still works, but but solar technology ain't come on right oh come on solar technology is improving it is but but my point is is like we know it works and it's sustainable so why are we not putting it out in front of people m more readily more steadily more you know as as an, another opportunity because i agree with with uh, 
I, I kind of agree with the selling the, the the power back to the grid. But instead of selling my power back to the grid, can I just have a couple of batteries hanging up in my garage and I can keep my own power? And that my backup <laughs> generator is the is the grid. So that if I run out of power, then oh, I got to flip a switch and I got to connect to the grid. But but for the most part, I got my own energy. I don't need your energy until my batteries round down, and then I <laughs> jump on the grid, right? And then and then I don't have to worry about selling it back. You know, but I'm recharging my batteries every time the sun shines or it's daylight or however that technology works. So I, I, I got some different thoughts on that. But I think I, I think you're right though. Like, I, they're, they, they, it needs to get more efficient. Um, how we make solar panels need to be more efficient, right? The materials that we use, right? But you're right. How do you make electric, bro? I've been saying that. I remember I was like Nick, you, where, where are you getting electricity from? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's still coming from fossil fuels guys all right i want to talk about a couple more things you guys want to hang around me with a little bit a little bit longer let's do it oh yeah i'm good bet, bet. yeah you know i touched on a, a briefly today um and that's that's health care in general not just women's reproductive health care but health care um there's some struggles with indiana rolling out its um um senior care program, I can't think of the name right now, um, where the, the managed care providers are not coming to an agreement with um, uh, the state. The state's like, yo, we're going to give you this much money. And they're like, we can't do anything with that much money. That's not enough money. Um, but this money's coming down from Medicare and Medicaid. Healthcare continues to be a thorn in the side of many Americans, many Hoosiers. Do y'all ever think that we're going to get to a place where... <laughs> The government is going to realize there are just certain things that they they do that are not going to be profitable and taking care of humans and their ability to live a really a quality life is more important than somebody's capitalistic bottom line. Go, Peter. It has to be, Dana. There's so many people that rely on these social safety nets just to exist. You know, one of those people is my mother. Uh, you know, in, in a while, uh, a couple decades ago, she suffered a brain injury, and I brought her here to a facility in Bloomington, and were it not for these federal safety nets, she would be living in abject poverty. I was mm -hmm. just knocking a door the other day, where I was talking to two women on their porch, and they were in the same situation. Uh, one woman was in her 70s, and she felt like she needed to go back to work just to afford her health care. Jeez. We need to stop thinking about th these people as numbers on a spreadsheet or an expense for state government and start thinking of them as our neighbors, because that's that's what's happening is, is people are getting kicked off of these roles and they have no place else to turn. And if they don't have a community like a church or a friend group or anything like that, it's it's pretty destitute. So we really need to make sure that these safety nets exist and we also need to make it easier for people, particularly the elderly, to get onto these services so that they can have uh, an end of life that is full of compassion and care and not poverty and misery. I love it. Derek? Um, the, hilarious that you bring this up. Um, I just did a 17-minute Facebook Live two days ago about health care. Um, and it laid out all my plans. Um, I believe that eventually we will come to universal health care. We have to as a country. Um, but until we get there, we need to provide a stipend, a monthly stipend, um, because everybody says tax breaks are good for the economy. When you're in the tax bracket that I'm in, tax break doesn't mean anything to you. You need a monthly stipend because we don't make enough money to itemize our taxes. We have to use the standard deduction. So tax breaks don't do anything for us. Um, so a monthly stipend to lower insurance cost, um, that needs to be a priority right now to lower the cost. I worked with people that in the state government that Half of their paycheck was going to health care. And that's state government. Jeez. It has a really great health care program, but it's expensive. Um, I'm lucky, well, kind of lucky, because I'm on TRICARE, which is uh, military retiree. Um, and I pay 
$38 a month for me and my entire family. Wow. But well, I had to get in there. Though, bro. Wait, you earned that. <laughs> yes, but to see people pay six hundred dollars yeah. a month or four hundred dollars a paycheck, so eight hundred a month, is ridiculous. And I mean, I I, yeah. I could get on the pulpit on this one because it is one of my big issues is health care, but. We need to, like I said, do a monthly stipend um, up to a certain amount for pay. And I'm talking $250,000 for a combined family, um, $175,000 for an individual. Um, because right now, to be minimum wage, you need to make $170,000 a year to be minimum wage anymore just to buy a house, yeah. to yeah. send your kids to college without burdening them with student loan debt that will cripple them. I still have student loan debt and I am 20 years out of college. I still have $100,000 in loans. Wait a minute, you, you've been in service for 10 years. You need to get on, you need to holler at Biden. He's forgiving right. loans, bro. Forgive He's, you, you need to go f sign up for the public service thing and get those things. You was in the I'm military. I'm on it. I'm on it. But because I've had some hiccups. It don't matter. It hasn't been a 10 year solid. It doesn't have to be. Okay. It's um, 10 years combined. Yes. It's 10 years combined. Okay, they must have changed that recently because last time I tried it, they're like, it has to be 10 years without missing a single payment. And I'm like, mm, no, gonna kill me. no, <laughs> no. Cause see, okay. So under the orange menace, they were like, no, you're not getting nothing back. Right. You know, yeah. we're not forgiving nothing. But once Biden came in, he started restoring stuff like right away and re initiating those. And I can understand how you could get like, you know, but your point is well made, you know, in that we people are paying out the wazoo and do, mm -hmm. people don't even realize why st student loans have gotten so high. People forget that the federal, go the, the state and federal governments used to subsidize colleges so the tuition oh, yeah. wouldn't be so high. But now that they've cut back on public funding to public institutions, now the, the, the institutions have to charge the student more. See, they don't, un yeah, man, people don't get it, man. I be wanting people to mm -hmm. like go to policy class, forget, Stop watching TV and and to the Housewives of Atlanta and go figure <laughs> out or, or some game show and go figure out how this stuff works. Because if you knew or, how it works, you'd be mad like me. Or you know what? The people that are in Congress complaining about the forgiveness program. Right. Oh, I paid back my student loans. You went to school when it was three thousand dollars a year. Yeah. Like shut your mouth. And the and the government subsidized public universities. Exactly. See, they don't they don't even think about that part. They don't they, they don't even think about the part. No. And if, it's so frustrating because it was like, but you but if you if the government hadn't stepped in and helped you out, you would have had to pay more. And they exactly. don't even understand that. But we need to push community college like Ivy Tech. Oh yeah, Ivy Tech. Go, go your first two years of college to Ivy Tech. Get your associate's degree which is now backed by iu iu's associate degree program is through ivy tech now i mean yeah. go to ivy tech spend a lot less or even for your bachelor's then go to your iu your ball state i don't want to say it but they're in my district go to purdue um I, I'm okay. sorry. I'm prisoning. Oh, oh you had to say that. I'm prisoning. Oh, no, 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 no. You gotta say, <laughs> listen, I root for all Indiana schools. I, I'm Indiana's own, so I'm going to root for all Indiana schools. But but I will say, like, oh, and I just had a thought, and then the conversation. Well, Go ahead, Peter. Let me, let me take it back to healthcare for just a second, because here in Monroe County, it's not just the people who are already receiving this important social safety net. It's the fact that the United Way of Monroe County is now talking about half of Monroe County households are Alice households, which means that they are one medical bill away from losing everything. House, oh. job. So it's, it's not just that we need the social safety net for the people who have it now. It's that there are others coming down the pike that we need to provide for as well. And, and that, that means that we need to be having a more robust conversation about health care. Oh, yeah.
Oh, yeah. And, we're, and it doesn't seem like we are planning for the future like we need to, because honestly, te technology has made it so that we live longer. Like, I remember when I what I thought a 53 year old was going to be. And I ain't that. <laughs> I am, I know that I'm 53, but I am not like what I saw a 53 year old was like we I'm like I'm actually exercising all the time and got all my teeth and, you know, still you, have, you know, and so, so we're living longer. And th th that's you probably are. why Nikki Haley be thinking that we all should work till we 75 I don't, it's crazy yeah. all right, all right, i well, don't want to work another 30 years I, right <laughs> <laughs> right well it'd be 20 for me um anyway uh one last topic i want to touch on and it's only because you know the orange man is uh is on has got like 88 indictments but i want to talk about criminal justice criminal justice is something and and particularly because uh peter iverson i know that one of the main issues down in monroe county is you guys apparently need a new jail and where you're putting that uh, and right. then also derek from a, a federal and national from a federal level you know we still are incarcerating people for marijuana but there are other states where they're making profits off of it um first i'm gonna divide, divide this up a little bit first uh, Peter, talk about what's going on and your vision for uh, the new jail and then how we uh, and then the both of you, how do we adjust and address the criminal justice reform that we definitely desperately need in our nation? Go, Peter. Fifteen years ago, we were alerted that the conditions 15. in the Monroe, 15, one five, that the conditions in the Monroe County Jail were unconstitutional due to overcrowding. The current commissioners have don't have a plan for this and it's time for a change. We need a new jail, and we need to understand that the way that we've been doing things is not the way that the community wants us to be doing it now. And what do I need, mean by that? I mean that we need to have regional treatment centers. So instead of incarcerating people with a diagnosed mental illness or a substance use disorder, they need treatment, not incarceration. I know that there's been some work in the Indiana legislature toward this end, and that's certainly something that we are looking for here in uh, the Indiana Uplands, uh, which is, incorporates part of Monroe County, is that those treatment centers so we stop incarcerating those, those individuals. But some individuals uh, do need to be incarcerated, particularly those who are a danger to society. And that's why uh, we are working collaboratively with the different stakeholders uh, here in Monroe County uh, to uh, build a new facility. It's going to be a justice campus. Uh, it's going to involve not only the Board of Judges, but also the prosecutor and public defender uh, and the sheriff's office, which includes uh, the jail. And uh, right now, uh, we're looking to uh, find a site for that. Um, we uh, just hired a transition team. And so there is some uh, initial progress, uh, but a lot of folks here want us to move a little bit faster. 15 years is too slow for Hoosiers. Well, yeah, because um, y'all lucky y'all ain't been sued out the wazoo. Well, that's exactly right. And so we've been working pretty diligently uh, with the uh, Board of Judges who have been uh, here in Monroe County doing a great job of running diversion programs. Uh, that's part of the reason why I think I'm going to make such a great commissioner is because I have that ability to have those relationships with uh, the different stakeholders and really push for these types of programs, the investments in these programs, so that we divert people away from the justice system that don't need to be involved with the justice system. And and we're working with individuals who are engaged with the justice system to ensure that we uh, have a warm handoff into community services so that recidivism is reduced. I love it. Derek, let's talk about criminal justice reform. First thing we need to do is decriminalize marijuana. Um, how many millions of people are in jail just because of marijuana? Um, decriminalize it and give amnesty for those who are in the prisons currently or the gels, release them. Let them go. Um, because, you know, it's ridiculous for one. Um, it's not a violent drug whatsoever. No, um, all you're going to do is lay back, want to sleep, and eat. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll take your and word for don't it. Don't forget the tax revenue. Localities yes. need that Yeah, tax exactly. I mean, so I've heard. Yeah, exactly. So I've heard. Yeah. The schools need it. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Colorado. Bay. Oh, yeah. Um, and plus, they get a rebate for just living in Colorado. Yeah. It's ridiculous. I would like more money from the state. 
you know, just for living here. Well, be careful because um, you know one of your one of your Republican gubernatorial candidates is talking about ending the income tax. So be careful with you because talk about, and public schools are in jeopardy now. I know it's probably. Uh, uh, you just, imagine the chaos, the local level. Oh yeah. Oh. She don't care. She gonna con- she, listen. They, oh. uh, they all they do at the state house is control local government anyway. Especially Marion County, Monroe. You County, said she Lake. is it Miss C oh. or Miss R? Uh, uh, it's Suzanne. She the one okay. talking about. Okay. <laughs> I'm like this is right now or crowd. I'm sorry, I interrupted you again. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, no, but where was I? You, we were talking oh, about criminal justice. Yeah. Um, we like. Mr. Iverson said, we need to better um, educate our first responders on what's a social work or mental health crisis. They don't deserve or belong in a jail. They belong getting the help they need. They don't need to be in jail. Um, And that just makes their condition worse, which perpetuates a cycle that'll put them out of jail. They're going to do something again, go back into jail. It's a revolving door Mm -hmm. most of the time in most of our um, jails and prisons. We need to teach our police officers, which by the way, 95% of our police officers are great human beings. 5% or rotten ass. Well, but see, here's the deal, though, bro. I'm going to stop you right there. I got to stop you now. And I, me and you been on one accord this whole time. If 95% of police officers know there's 5% that's messed up, then the 95 is messed up, too, because they should have dealt with it. Yeah, they that's need to I'm fix saying. that issue. That's all I'm saying. Um, quantified immunity is a huge issue. The police unions, I'm all for unions, but the police unions need to admit the fact that it's messed up. Mm-hmm. And they are protecting those 5%. And so are the other 95%. They're turning away, turning a blind eye to it. And that needs to stop completely. Um, It's disproportionate. Number of our black and brown citizens are locked up behind bars um, for, at times, completely trumped up reasons. Of course. There you go. (laughs) Added reasons. Um you piss off a cop, they're going to add three or four more charges against you. Mm. Um, So we need to better educate first responders on mental health, on what's actually a crime, how to better deal with empathy and sympathy on an issue. Um, Do they really need to arrest somebody for X reason? Um, I'm not talking violent crimes. Violent crimes, of course, arrest them, put them in jail after they've gone through the um, judicial process. And can we please have better defense for these people that are wrongfully arrested? Um, the yeoman's work to the public defenders, but at times they do not have the time right they're over to, overwhelmed yeah overwhelmed and i mean that's all across the the board peter you look uh, like you want to jump in there i want to i want to do a little bit of ray of sunshine here there's a really really great program run out of centerstone in here mm-hmm. here in uh, monroe county and bartholomew county uh, with the mobile crisis units. Oh. This is the collaboration between Centerstone, the uh, police, and the sheriff's departments to uh, deploy uh, mobile crisis teams through Centerstone in certain situations instead of law enforcement. And again, it's a collaboration, right? So no one's stepping on each other's toes. Or everyone's working mm-hmm. together. And I know that uh, Centerstone's really interested in replicating this model throughout Indiana uh, as a way of, uh, of ensuring that diversion um, is is a, a thing that we're doing um, in our communities. I think this is going to be a great thing. And of course, it started right here. In in so is that a, is that a, that, is that a, a not-for-profit? 
Uh, Centerstone is a um, federally funded, um, it, it's a, I'm sorry, excuse me, it's a for-profit uh, mental health institution uh, here in uh, the region. Um, they do receive uh, grants and things like that from us and um, uh, from federal entities, um, but they're, they're really, a, a, these federal institute or these mental health institutions are really uh, taking the bull by the horns in a lot of these situations where mental health uh, or substance use disorder uh, is, uh, is an issue and coming up with uh, innovative solutions in collaboration with, uh, like I said, law enforcement, local elected officials, board of judges, things like that. So a lot of good things happening uh, when folks work together. Well, exactly. and, and the point that I made earlier, this is, you know, this is just shows that sometimes the stuff that the government needs to do is just not going to be profitable. It's just about helping the people. It's, it's not about profit. Hey. Guys, I think we probably should wrap this thing up. We've been going out. I, I knew it was going to be a great conversation. Um, Derek, tell the people where they can find you. They can find me at my website at DerekHolder.com. Uh, it has all my socials. Um, also, Derek Holder for Congress on Facebook and Holder for Congress on the old tweet box. And I know that the primary is coming up next Tuesday, but do yeah. you have any events or any uh, volunteer opportunities for folks in the future? Not in this next week. We're just hunkering down and okay. riding the wave until Tuesday. Okay, and you'll be able to post. You'll post some stuff up when you're ready to have volunteers. You have a, a volunteer sign up page on your website. I have a volunteer sign up page, and I also have an internship sign up page. Um, I am partnered with IU campuses to provide um, internships. Nice. That's so, dope. I, I am the only. Sorry. I am the only one currently in my race, both Democrat and Republican, that has an internship program because we need to get college students and young people involved in politics immediately. Is it, is it a paid internship? Not right now, because okay. honest, <laughs> I'm running this campaign on... $2,200. Well, we, well, no, we're going to click the link and we're going to get you some more money. We're going to donate right. to you. We're going to raise some money. That can be done, though. Yeah, yeah. And that's my big thing. Well, you should reach out to me at Act Blue so I can help you out. Uh, that's my, you know, my daytime gig. <laughs> oh, yeah. Reach out to me and and put something on my calendar so I can walk you through some tips and tricks. <laughs> Peter, tell the people where they can find you. All right. Two ways you can find Peter Iverson. Number one, go to peteriverson.org. Number two, Get in your car and come down to Bloomington. It's a great place to be. Uh, restaurants are great. We got Lake Monroe. It's starting to get warm. Go for a hike. Come down and see me. I'd love to see you down here. And of course, uh, you can find all of my information at peteriverson.org. And while you're down here, we've got some other cool candidates. Tom Horrocks is going to yeah. be joining uh, Matt Pierce in the State House, and he needs some help too. So uh, we are all canvassing until Tuesday. Uh, shout out to the Indiana uh, College Dems as well as the Indiana College, uh, College Dems. Uh, we are uh, out uh, for, uh, let's see, every single day we're out knocking doors because it's GOTV time. Love it's time it. to get out. Oh. Love yeah. it. Hey, Peter yeah. said it. It is time to get out the vote. Thank you guys so much for joining me. This was fantastic. Uh, Derek. Uh, we probably should be careful when we're in a room together because all this energy that we bring in might be slightly <laughs> combustible. But you let me know if you need some help. Uh, reach out to me so I, we can talk. Because I just, I mean, I love your energy. Peter, you know I love you, bro. I, I didn't even know you hadn't been on the show. I just assumed it had already happened, right? Uh, well, guys, let's do it again. <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much. Hang on. Don't hang up just yet, y'all. Don't hang up just yet. Guys. Wow, wow, wow. What a fantastic show. The energy was high, you know, and, and for the last show before the primary race, I couldn't have had asked for two better guests to come on the show uh, and chop it up and just have a good time. Because you know what? Voting and politics are fun. And anyone that tells you that it's not fun, they have been hanging out with Indiana's own. So guys, if you've already voted, and you have some available time on Tuesday, would you consider volunteering um, and helping out um, to get people to the polls or bring snacks to the poll workers or anything like that? If you could, please. I've done it in the past when I was a precinct committee person. I'm actually flying out to D.C. on Tuesday after I vote. Uh, but there's always opportunities for all of us to be civically engaged. 
And I'm going to tell you, voting is the least you can do. You heard from two amazing candidates today who have plans, who have rich, rich histories of, of public service. These are the kind of people that we want to elect. But instead, you, you know, you got these people running around talking about I'm an NDI and oh, my God, the radical Black Lives Matter. Because I'm still trying to figure out why Black Lives Mattering is a radical idea. I, I don't get that. But that was in a governor's campaign ad, a governor's campaign ad. And every one of the Republican gubernatorial candidates are saying that they want to get rid of DEI programs. Why? They, they don't want competition from amazing and capable black and brown people. What is it? See, because what happens is, is people vote for, or they vote for, they, they hire who they know. And if Indiana is 88.5% white, that's all I'm saying. So we got we've got to diversify things. We got to make sure that we have um, pe- we're electing people that are going to look out for all the people. So do not miss out on your opportunity to have a say in your government. Just like I be saying the things over here on this mic, you have a say on your government. Go vote on Tuesday. Go vote. Get out the vote. Do your thing. And I will holler at y'all next week. Peace. Turn left is the property of Black Pearl IT Solutions. Executive producer, Indiana's own Dana Black. Music by www.binsound.com.